everybody. How's everybody doing today? Yay, yay. We can't hear you right now, but we will. Um, that uh, piece of music was from the Cosmo Soul Express Band. It was recorded, uh, well, in the, I guess, the midst of the pandemic. I'm not even sure what that means anymore, but, but that was recorded remotely. Um, and it's easy to see that Canada's got some of the best musicians in the world. You can, you can just tell from that. It's incredible. So, um, and the, that, uh, track ain't that peculiar is kind of, a a theme for the times we've been in, I think. Um, so thanks to all the players there. You'll, one of the people, a lot of you probably know is Charmaine Dennison from Yamaha. You saw her take the lead in the, in the second verse. What an incredible singer she is. Um, when, when we played the track last year, I called her up. I said, Charmaine, oh my God, I had no idea. What an incredible singer. So what's the meetup about? Um, as you saw in some of the notes, we usually do a live event at the NAMM show. We have been for many, many years. And last year, of course, uh, no live events of any kind. So we did a meetup. And the idea is to get people, they can uh, talk to each other, actually see each other and ask questions, maybe learn something, get a bit of uh, inspiration maybe. So that, that's really what it's all about, a good chance to, to connect. Um, our country is so huge that just by its nature, we're all, you know, especially in the last two years, we've all been so far apart from each other. So you can see if you look at the participants, you probably know half the people that are here. I certainly do. So it's, it's a great opportunity. Um, all of you, I've noticed already, I don't have to really tell you about the uh, chat. You guys are chatting up a storm there, so no problem there. Um, we will make the transcript available. So in the transcript, it won't have anything private, but anything that's general or sent to all, that will come to you later. Uh, this whole thing will be recorded as well. You'll get an email in the next few days uh, enabling you to uh, um, you know, watch the whole thing again on YouTube. Um, at the end of the, the sessions proper today, um, we're doing breakout sessions for different ones. So you'll be able to choose the person of your uh, choosing, but know that once you're in there, um, you can switch back and forth to any of the sessions you want. So you can take five minutes with each speaker. You can do whatever you like. Um, some people get talking so much, they just never get out of there. And then we go home and they're still here at midnight talking away. So uh, um, also you'll get an email about resources as well. So we put together a bunch of different things that you can download, websites, other things that will be useful as a result of this. So you'll see that. So agenda, these are the speakers today. We're very, very, very pleased to have this cast of characters as well, but knowledgeable people, industry experts with us today. And um, Joe from NAM, John MacArthur, Glory. Um, I've talked to all these people in, in the last while. And then of course, at the very end, um, we're gonna do the, the uh, breakout sessions. So any questions you have, um, we're not gonna pay too much attention to the chat for that to start with. So save them for the breakout sessions. Once we hit the breakout sessions, we're gonna unmute everybody's mic and your video will be on, your audio will be on, it'll just be like the, the Wild West. And then you'll be able to ask questions of the session leaders, but also just discuss things like with the people that are here today, there's something to be learned from every single person that's here for sure. Okay, so Joe, Joe I've known for forever. Joe runs the NAM show and the NAM organization. He responds to my emails faster than anybody in the world. It's kind of amazing, actually. He certainly knows, unlike some people, how to hit reply. A couple of things you may not know about Joe. One is that he was a drummer. I guess you're always a drummer, I suppose. And he's also from Buffalo, New York. So when we look at the, the two feet of snow that we got here in Niagara Falls on Monday, Joe could just say, well, that's, that's summertime in Buffalo. That's just nothing. So please welcome Joe Lamont from NAM. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, I guess I'm 
reporting in from Carlsbad, California. Uh, sorry about some of the chat about the chilly weather. Two years ago today, we were all in Anaheim together. And that was, uh, seems like a long time ago. It seems like a lifetime ago for some of us. And uh, yesterday we started Believe in Music, our second virtual, you know, gathering. So um, contrasting the two is, is quite startling if you, if you really think about how much has changed in a couple of years. It's good to see everyone. I really hope, you know, I hope you're doing okay. It's been a hell of a year. Um, last year when we got together like this, it was like, okay, we're going to be back. It's uh, this is a one and done. <clears throat> and I think this thing has dragged on much longer than anyone thought or anyone had hoped. Um, from the anchor desk yesterday and believe in uh, the Believe TV, I made a couple comments about, you know, what a time this is. And, and, each one of us have had very unique experiences, either individually or with your businesses and how you've fared through this. And each of us have had the highs and lows of all. And many of us have had great loss. And I just wanted to recognize that, that we've lost some incredibly wonderful industry friends. Um, many of us have lost family. Uh, I know I have, and it's just, it's just tough. You know, and I just wanted to recognize that, that, you know, we're tough, we're survivors, we're going to get through all this, but um, make no mistake, this was, this was a testing. And uh, if we get through this, I'm convinced we're going to be, or we've created, especially with the younger folks on the call, you're the next greatest generation. You're the next greatest generation because getting through this is going to prepare you for anything <laughs> that comes that comes later. Um, I can only imagine 15 years, 20 years from now, some of the young people on this call are in their offices running their empires and their businesses and a staffer comes running in and says, boss, we have a huge problem. We have a huge problem. And you're just gonna sit there and you're gonna sit back in your chair and you're gonna go, huge problem? Sit down. Let me show you what a huge problem is. <laughs> shutting down the world for a couple of years. That's, that's a problem. Now, what do you got for me? And you'll solve it like everything. You're, you're, this is going to be, this is a mark, our, our ability to lead. This is, uh, this is wartime and, and, and no one's in, intents and purposes. Even, even the stores and the companies that are thriving in this, these are wartime decisions you're making, whether it's supply chain or whether it's how to manage um, you know, the opening or closing of businesses. These are wartime decisions. And, and, We've been in the same boat with NAM. Um, you know, we're in the part of the industry, if you're in the concert business or if you do a lot of rentals, you're involved in live sound or event technology, we're, that's us in a way. We're, our primary business as an association is we help people associate. And that means bringing them together. And that puts us in that square crosshairs of the, of the industry that has been hurt the most by the pandemic, which is bringing people together. And, uh, you know, we, we made an easy decision to cancel 21. That was an easy one right in the middle of all this. Um, our governor actually made that for us by saying there's been no large events in California. So that's an easy one. Tougher event to cancel was 22. And many of you might have, uh, I think some of you snuck down into the States last year for Summer NAM in Nashville. And uh, at that time, it was all systems go for January 22 right now. And it was going to be a wonderful reunion of the industry. We thought we'd get everyone back together again. We thought this thing would be behind us. And then we started hearing this little thing about Delta in the weeks after Summer NAM. And what was Delta? And it's spreading. And I'll tell you, within three weeks, we had to make a decision to cancel 22. And we had to make a decision to move it. And moving an event the size of NAM in that venue requires two weeks of uh, of the venue to be open. And so Anaheim, God love them. They moved 12 different events to get us room uh, to move to June this year. Um, and that was a pretty good effort done. And it's medical conferences and educational. It's no one group takes up the center like we do. So over two weeks, there's different groups that had to move and they moved them all, some to different cities, some to different years, some to different months. So, so we moved to June and, uh, and that was, that was a tougher decision. That's a, we haven't done we haven't done that in a long time. Probably since World War II, we had to make a decision to move a show like that. 
And now we have to decide what to do about 23. You know, then comes along Omicron and there's another, you know, all I could say is right now, thankfully, we, we would not have been able to gather today in Anaheim. Uh, we could have, uh, we wouldn't have had many, many, many countries. We wouldn't have had many, many companies because they just couldn't do it, couldn't do it safely. I don't think we could have done it safely. Um, so maybe that was a good move in hindsight to move to June. It's no guarantee. Hopefully June will be better. Hopefully supply chains will open up. Hopefully some new gear will be out into the marketplace. Uh, but um, actually, I need you guys as a favor. Could I put you guys to work for a second? I'm going to see if I can see everybody. Can, I don't know if you got a, a, a survey function on this thing, uh, Glory, but um, what we're wrestling with is 23. And from June to January 23 is kind of a short run, six months. Uh, I'm a little worried about another variant um, that might come along. We may be out of this. I mean, there's all kinds of opinion. I'm no Dr. Fauci, but uh, by January, we're not sure. We have an option to move this thing to April in 23 and then back to January in 24. Gut feeling, thumbs up, thumbs down, 23, April or January for 23. You think we could pull something off in January? Do you think we'd be better off pushing it into springtime and getting out of some of that flu season. What do you think about April? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Got lots of responses coming up in the chat. Okay. Yeah, you know, we just have this muscle memory of January and it's killing me to have to move it twice. But, but by 24, my instincts, I mean, many of you guys, look, Jack's on here. So many of the veterans are on. You've been doing this a long time. January is kind of our industry time, right? We kick off the year, we launch new products, we get so much media, it's our time. The Saskatchewan group loves coming to Southern California in January. So that's a big Actually, plus. Especially if you're from some of the colder parts of Canada. Yeah, that's a big plus, yeah. Yes. 24, January, thumbs up? Or do you think we might have a run in the springtime? Again, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm like a, an attorney leading the witness. Guilty, Your Honor. <laughs> I, I really think January is where we need to end up. Uh, but what do you guys think about now we're in 24? Thumbs up or thumbs down for January? This is an unofficial polling. I won't haunt any of you individually for your choices. Okay. I know. April's is, is, April's a crowded month. You're right. NAB, we've got holiday. Uh, NESMD is many of you go to the school music dealer uh, conference down here. Okay. Wow, Jim, this has been worth it for me already. I got some great feedback and uh, grateful to each one of you. I was going to say, for... Joe, as well, if you want us to send out a survey on behalf of NAM, we can do that. It's really oh. easy. I'll yeah. mention that to Andy. We can put all those choices in there and send it out to the whole market. Thank you. And then you'll know what the Canadians think, at least. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, we've been wrestling with, and I'm just, Sharon, you know, Jim didn't tell me what to talk about. I don't know how much time do I have, Jim? A um, couple more minutes, maybe? You've got, uh, yeah, you've got about uh, three minutes. Wow. Well, you know, we've wrestled with two main questions. And, and as, as an association, this is your group, right? I mean, this is, NAM is made up of all of us. And we're all collectively owners of this organization. And therefore, we all have kind of a, an oar in the water on it, you know? Speaking of side note, if any of you have been canoeing in Quetico and the Boundary Waters, I'm thinking of going there this summer and I would love to get in the chat. Anyone who has inside information about fishing and canoeing in Quetico and the Boundary Waters. Sorry, gratuitous plug there. Um, two main things about, about a, a gathering like NAM. The when, which we're trying to sort through, that's a pandemic issue. When can we gather safely and countries open up freely to travel and the when, and we're that's getting solved pretty quickly here in the next month, probably. The what is the longer question? What is a gathering like NAM anymore, right? I mean, I, you know, I always thought there was three main parts of it. New products drive any industry. They just do. I don't care what industry you're in, new products and innovation drives the industry. Two, learning, education, training, learning, being better at our craft. Um, and three, the networking, that um, accidental meeting that creates a career path that someone would, have had, would not have had, the chance meeting between an exhibitor and an attendee that creates a whole new product or maybe even a whole new product category. So I always, that what is, to me, it's still those three things, new product, innovation, introduction, media, bringing things to market, two, training, 
and education and just being better at what we do as craftsmen and, and, and everyone in the industry. And then three, that kind of glue, the networking, the um, parts that, that maybe are very humanistic that maybe we've lost on some of this. Um, and by the way, thank God for Teams and Zoom, we would have been lost without them, but I think we are better off when we were able to gather personally. So that's the what, but how does an exhibitor look at a, an exhibit now? Are they launching new product or could they do that virtually? Will they do more content creation so that they can have more global reach? I mean, we're gonna have this believe uh, in music on top of NAM now. We're gonna have this digital virtual show on top of the show in June. It's what believe is, this time doing believe was really us just getting all our IT together to make sure that's a, now our registration system. And that's now our digital NAM show on top of the NAM show. And yesterday was the, the actual trial run for what June is gonna look like. But what's it gonna look like? And I think that's gonna take longer. I think that's gonna take some years to figure out post pandemic, um, what the industry looks like as we come out. Um, yes, we've had some great booms in, in guitars and in electronic keyboards. We've had some real suffering in uh, live event technology and, and what the concert and touring and, and business is gonna look like. We've had a explosion in home recording and all this cool peripherals I have on my desk here. This has to sort itself out into what this gathering is going to look like. But my instincts tell me we are human. We're in the music business, even more prone to want to gather because of music. And as we just saw, even in the opening song, which was awesome, by the way, to see Evan play, we want to be together. We want to play music together, not on little tiles and little squares. And that's what we're going to hopefully do when we get back together again. So. You know, it's uh, definitely rougher. All of us have these little gray hairs or deeper lines on our face now. Like, not all of you. Some of you look younger than I remember. What the <laughs> hell? But I, on the other hand, have aged in dog years. So, but we're getting through it. And we're getting through it together. And I miss each and every one of you. And I can't wait to see you. Uh, we'll do the reception again, Jim. And it'll be, it'll be more special than ever to get everyone together in the same room. And uh and telling war stories. And, and we will have some war stories, I'm sure. So that's what I got, Jim. Uh, it mainly just was a, a pleasure to be here, an honor to be here, be with you, and uh, and just be open to all your feedback and keep realizing that we are all in this plane together. And uh, we're going to either land this plane together or you know, we're in it together. Uh, and I want us all to, to get through this and into the great thing that comes past an event like a a global recession or a pandemic just throughout history, what comes after this is usually a extended period of, of peace and prosperity. And I can't wait to see that and be there with you. So that's it. Back to you, Jim. Thank you very much, Joe. And uh, you can join Joe in his breakout session in just a little while and get into a little more detail. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention about Joe is that he's also, he's also a biker as well, if I recall. <laughs> he, he rides is it a harley yeah, actually a couple of years ago i went up to see mark at cosmo and i rode through uh and cut over back into uh to michigan now quick side note does anyone seen is mark on is anyone from cosmo on you've had guests have become famous for a shoplifting incident on december 30th which happens to be my birthday by the way it's in the news all over down here that someone uh -huh. stole a les paul down their pants is that is that true I mean, I'm, I'm impressed by the way. And I hope they caught the person as of the news reports down here, they still haven't caught the person. Is it, that didn't, true? it didn't name Cosmo, but it had to be. And I just, it did the name the news down here. They had Cosmo they had pictures okay. of Cosmo. Yeah. yeah. Well, that guy's, that guy's got a big pants. If he can fit a Gibson into his pants, that's for sure. Well, I wanted to share with Mark when I was back at Skip's music in Sacramento, we had an Elvis impersonator come in one day and steal a four track down his pants. And wow. the reason we knew that, luckily we had cameras and we could piece it together after we saw this big, you know, gap in the in the four track display. Going back and watch it was hilarious. But luckily, I would say as an Elvis impersonator, he wasn't doing the late 50s, early 60s cool Elvis. He was doing the chubbier Vegas Elvis. So there was plenty of room for the four track. Um, but I don't know how you get a Les Paul down your down your trousers. That's uh, if Mark is on or if someone can share that with Cosmo. I think that is, that should be a NAM use session right there a, as to, as to how a, to prevent that from ever happening again. There's a joke there somewhere. So, um, and as, 
Joe mentioned, in uh, June we'll be doing the uh, uh, Canadian reception at NAM as well. Joe has been at that the last couple of times, and uh, we're looking forward to that. Yeah. Thank you very much. We'll see you in the breakout sessions. Yeah. Okay. So John MacArthur. Uh, John MacArthur is one of the uh, best known and most competent uh, salespeople in the Canadian market. Um, we tend to talk maybe once a month or so, and uh, we sort of go through it all, and then we conclude that we've solved all the world's problems. Of course, none of that's true, but that's something we like to do anyway. Um, so John's got a long history in, in pro audio and uh, um, and lighting and production. And from his bio, I didn't even know he was in radio production as well. So that's something new I learned. So let's uh, turn it now over to John MacArthur. Thank you, Jim. and. Uh... I, Joe, that was an inspiring chat. Uh, thank you very much. We're on this plane together. I think that's a perfect tie into what uh, I'm going to talk about today. You know, we all have had unique experiences, as Joe has said. And uh, for those of you that have a screen, I will not bore you to death with this super long uh, uh, PowerPoint that I have, which I can't seem to share. So that's okay. We'll just talk about it. Um, but uh, what Jim had asked me to talk about today was developing and maintaining strong industry relationships. You know, we've had 20 months or so to go over that and discuss those uh, those differences and opportunities and and, you know, how to how to, there we go, how to make uh, people talk to us and uh, how we engage them. And of course, you know, we need to know our product when we talk about that, but we also need to know the people we're talking to as well. So when I was researching this, I remembered an article I read way back in 2013 out of the Harvard Business Review, which is not something I do every day, but it was very interesting, certainly for a salesperson like myself and for people that are in our industry, this is important as well, uh, in, in my opinion. Uh, the article was uh, written by Amy Cuddy and a bunch of other people. And it talks about warmth and how to, how to you know, project that and how it affects your influence and that kind of thing. And uh, so uh, we'll go through this because uh, it's a 13 page article. So I thought I'd, uh, I'd uh, cut it down and uh, mention the things that are obvious rather than the things that we all know. So this slide, I was going to say top traits of successful salespeople, but really it's successful communicators, which we all are. You know, competency is certainly important to us. You got to know your products or your what's your what's your your service. Uh, you have to have empathy. Okay, but actually, the order that you put this in is very very important. Empathy first. You got to listen, and you still have to know your products, of course, right? So empathy gets you in the door, and competency, reliability, integrity, vulnerability—all of those things keeps you there. Particularly now, you know when when we've got businesses closing down and maybe opening in two weeks and not and closing. And I mean, I just went out to get my daughter's skates sharpened and I had to call the guy to make sure he was open. He says, yep, we're not closed yet. But that's, that's a real problem for all of us. You know, are we going to be in business? How are we've all got issues to share? We all have those unique experiences as Joe mentioned, but we have a lot of commonality between them as well. So, when we're talking to people, we've got to we got to be humble, you know. We're proud and presumptuous is a recipe for mistrust and disunity, of course. So it can lead to failure, and humility that we have can go certainly a long way to show that we all face the similar challenges. Kind of like that guy skating, the uh, sharp skating, skate sharpening guy that I talked to today. Uh, try and put yourself in the other person's shoes, because we do have that common beam that we walk across, but listen to them, you know, admit that you might not have all the answers at the time, but, but be willing to find out uh, solutions for that. You know, if you're empathetic, uh, we all create a shared sense of purpose, right? Um, nothing, as it says here, nothing's more inspiring than someone who is empathetic, right? Competent people, which we all are, but that lack warmth, often elicit resentment. I think we can all think of somebody like that in our lives that you think, oh, that guy knows everything. Oh, he knows everything. Oh, that, that's, that's resentment. You know, and that if, if there was a little humility in that, that goes a long way uh, in our world, for sure. 
being able to see something through other people's eyes extends our or your capacity to understand uh, patterns in our business environment and that kind of thing. And, you know, just be able to relate to other people's perspectives and listening, right? Listen actively. I mean, uh, here I am talking uh, nonstop right now, but we, whenever we're in a conversation, we often spend a lot of that conversation waiting for our chance to talk. Oh, I want to, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something, but instead we should really be giving our full attention to listening to the other person. You know, when I, when I started in this business uh, a long time ago, oops, I would like to go backwards on that. There we go. When we started, uh, when I started in this business a long time ago, I worked for a company where one of the people, all they did was talk all the time to customers. They talk and talk and talk and tell and tell and tell and talk and talk. And I was young and they were successful and I thought that was the way to do it, but I felt uncomfortable about it. And then over time, as Joe mentioned, you know, time, you talk to the older people like us and things change. But over time, I realized what the problem was that is that there was no listening going on there, right? He was not hearing what people were saying. There was no active listening going on, which of course is underrated. It's an underdeveloped skill in our business, right? You should, you should listen to the other person's perspective and be willing to be molded by them, right? Be willing to, to, to be like them for that conversation. You might learn something. You might be able to build it into your life as you go along, right? So when we put a sincere effort into the uh, understanding the other person, we come off as being genuinely concerned, which we truly are. And what does that do? It makes us trustworthy, right? So active listening helps us improve the experience of the conversation, but it also ensures, as it says here on this uh, screen here, uh, that you grasp what the other person is saying. And you're going to learn something. You're going to learn in our business, you know, what, what product they want, what service they need, what kind of problems they're having in their life. We just have to listen to them because in a way we're, we're kind of psychiatrists. So we're validating their feelings. So before people decide what they think of our products or services, they're going to, you know, decide what they think of us. And if we're listening and we're doing that, that's, that's important. Right? So if, uh, if we show that we hold, you know, roughly the same viewpoint, or we can understand the other person's uh, point of view, empathy, um, you know, we see it through their eyes. It's common sense. That's all it is, right? That's a, the ultimate qualification for being listened to. So we got to acknowledge their fears and concerns, other people's concerns, you know, say, I know, I know things are tough right now. I know that we can't sell products, or I can't get into your restaurant right now, or you can't, or you can only sell to me at the curb, or I can't get into your gym. Those are all real life problems that are, I can't get out of my gym right now because they're closed. Well, that's just, you know, it's inconvenient for me, but it's awful for the gym owner. How's he paying his rent? What's happening there, right? People will respect you for addressing the, that elephant in the room and just listening about it and listening what, what they have to say. That's, that's important. So this article, this HBR article is Connect Then Lead. Strength and warmth is really what it's all about, okay? And this infographic that's on the, uh, on the screen here, for those of you that can see it, uh, warmth is across the horizontal, strength is on the vertical. And you look at that and it really does outline how, how it unfolds. You wanna be high strength and high warmth. You wanna know your stuff, but you wanna appear and truly genuinely come across as you're caring because you come across as you're caring because you are caring, right? That's extremely important. It's judged, your warmth is judged before your competence is. So takeaways from the 13 page article uh, from the HBR research is that empathy is important. We know that if you think about it, but this, this highlights it. You know, warmth is the, is the way to get through to influencing people. You establish that you hear them, you understand them, and you can be trusted by whoever you're talking to. Remember, before people decide what they think of your message, they decide what they think of you or us. So demonstrate not only empathy, but common sense. It's that simple, it's very easy. I haven't bored you to death, hopefully, with a bunch of slides, but thank you for your time. These are my sources uh, that I used for this, um, this uh, presentation. It, like I said, it goes back to 2013, so it's about nine years old, but it's very, very accurate. It's a good read if you're into it. So uh, check it out and uh, 
thank you very much. I'm uh, looking forward to hearing the rest of what everybody has to say. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, John. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to connecting you in the breakout sessions at the end. I'm sure people have lots of questions. So uh, we're gonna get back to our programming here. I think the PowerPoint's coming back. So um, if you go to uh, Wikipedia, and I'm sure lots of you have, and you look up the word enthusiastic, okay? You'll find Glory's picture. <laughs> and I can attest to that because we had a great conversation yesterday. And the other part too, if you look up the word persistent, and in particular, pleasantly persistent, guess what? You'll find Glory's picture. <laughs> There she is. And if you think it's cold here, imagine it in Winnipeg. It's brutal. So Glory's accomplished a lot of things in publishing, uh, has become uh, a, you know, a well-known speaker, and uh, of course, a longtime piano teacher. But you know, she can tell you all that stuff. So I'll just turn it over to Glory right now. Well, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, so I'm really excited. I, I have a question for you in my, in my talk today. And so I'm going to kind of lead you through a little bit of a thinking process. And I want to thank John. John, you might think that John and I were hanging out last week because uh, I share many of his thoughts as well. So thank you very much, John. I enjoyed your presentation. So my question for all of you is, have you ever felt overwhelmed? Me too. In fact, every day of my life, for many years, until I understood a process of how to reduce the overwhelm and live my life the way that I wanted to, with joy and purpose and passion. And today, I'm going to take you through my journey of overcoming the overwhelm as a professional music educator. And I believe that in my journey, you will find some pearls of wisdom that you can use to reduce the overwhelm in your life too. So an educator's life is kind of like a multi-strand pearl necklace, hence me wearing this today. Why? Because there are three strands in our lives, professional, family, and personal. And we often experience overwhelm in not just one, but all three strands. And they can become so tangled that it may be very difficult to separate them. But here's the thing. By separating one strand at a time, you are reducing the overwhelm. For me, it happened on three separate events. And events and experiences in your life can help you untangle your strands. So let me take you to the event when I untangled the first strand of my professional overwhelm at the coffee shop. I was attended, I was invited to attend a music teachers meeting at a local coffee shop. And the discussions on the business of teaching and finances and the curriculum were intimidating. And overwhelming questions just entered my mind. And I sat firmly on my hands because I was afraid to ask a stupid question. And that is the professional overwhelm of feeling inadequate. Imposter syndrome is very real. Feeling like you don't belong, you're not worthy, and I felt it deeply. There's always someone, as you've heard today, there's always someone with more degrees, more experience, more knowledge, but that does not mean that you're not deserving or capable. And I watched the body language of the other teachers as we talked over coffee. And I could see that they were just as nervous and embarrassed about asking questions as I was. If nobody was going to ask questions, I would never get the answers and neither would they. So it was time to take a bold step outside of my comfort zone and make a paradigm shift. So I made a fundamental change. I bravely raised my hand to ask a question and then another one and then another one. 
And I thought that these would be met with ridicule. I noticed that other teachers previously silenced lean forward as if to say, I have the same question. By asking questions, you can reduce your professional overwhelm. That's what teaching communities are meant for, to support each other, just as we are all here today. I had helped others by asking questions and collecting answers as a group. These would have been left unanswered if I didn't have the courage to raise my hand. I untangled the first strand in the pearl necklace by shifting my paradigm from comparison mode that made me feel weak to community mode that made me feel strong. May I invite you to untangle this strand with a paradigm shift to reduce the professional overwhelm in your life. I untangled the second strand of my family overwhelm, standing in the doorway that divided my home from my music studio. Now, like many music teachers, my music studio was part of my home. And there was a door that separated me, the teacher, from me, the mom. And as I passed through the doorway, overwhelmed with family activities, I shouted to my daughter, clean your room, do your homework, brush your teeth. I have to go teach. I transformed into me, the teacher, from me, the mom. And I found that my tonality and my attitude changed completely. There was no shouting, you know, go get your books to the piano and sit down immediately. Instead, there were questions about their day and a transition into the music lesson. At the end of the day, as I opened the same door that I had shut before the class began, my daughter was standing there in the doorway waiting for me. And with her big brown eyes, she looked up at me and she quietly said, Mom, when you come through this door, can you be the teacher on this side of the door too? That moment, I became the student. I understood what my daughter was hearing and what my daughter was feeling. From the day that I became a teacher, I pledged to be empathetic to my students. But empathy was needed beyond the music studio. I untangled the second strand in the pearl necklace by opening the empathy door of understanding and meaningful conversation with family. May I invite you to untangle this strand with empathy to hear what they hear and to feel what they feel and reduce the family overwhelm in your life. I untangled the third strand of my personal overwhelm when I opened my jewelry box. I remember looking at my mother's pearl necklace laying in the jewelry box and thinking of her I wondered, what are my expectations as an educator, as a mother and a human being? And I was overwhelmed with a long list of desires and obligations. And I asked myself, how did my mom achieve everything that she did? And I got the answer as if she was talking to me and saying, accept and reduce the overwhelm of expectations from yourself. Know that you can overcome it by simply living each day and each moment as it comes with grace. I felt the heaviness of responsibilities and expectations lift off my shoulders. 
That day, I decided to leave the jewelry box open to remind me that I need to live in the moment and not dwell on the baggage of overwhelm. We are all feeling that right now. Being able to take a step back, see the big picture, and then simply start with small steps, the little things, just as each little pearl creates the strands of your life. You can remain in the world of personal overwhelm or gracefully accept the gift of being who you are and live life in the moment. I untangled the third strand in the pearl necklace by accepting the overwhelm and knowing that I could overcome it. May I invite you to untangle this strand with grace and live in the moment by accepting yourself and overcoming the personal overwhelm in your life. So now you know how I untangled my three strand pearl necklace and started living with less overwhelm in my professional family and personal life. I know this process can help you untangle your pearl strands too. Your strands could be different your events could be different and your experiences could be different than mine. But the process of untangling the three strands will help you overcome the overwhelm. The world is your oyster. Each precious pearl of wisdom creates the strands of your life. So when you visit a coffee shop, Will you think about how you can untangle the strand of your professional overwhelm to shift your paradigm with confidence and certainty? When you stand in a doorway, will you think about how you can untangle the strand of your family overwhelm to open meaningful conversations with empathy and respect? And when you look in a jewelry box, Will you think about how you can untangle the strand of your personal overwhelm to embrace grace with self-love and acceptance? Now, you have a choice to live with joy, purpose, and passion, to overcome the overwhelm and untangle the strands of your professional life, your family life, and your personal life. So which strand will you untangle first? I'm Glory St. Germain. I'm an international best-selling author, a TEDx speaker, a uh, publisher, and um, host of many online courses and so on. And I just want to say thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much, Glory. Um, for those of you that want to explore this topic a little bit more, Glory also has a TED Talk. And uh, you can find that quite easily and, 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 yes. and uh, check that out. And of course, Glory will be in one of the breakout sessions in a little while. So you can explore this area even a bit more. So uh, our last speaker today, um, Doug is a new acquaintance for me. He connected with Michael Rain, who's our uh, editor in chief. And he, apparently he's, there's going to be some things that Doug has written that will be in the next Canadian music trade. So Doug and I had a five minute meeting the other day that took an hour and a half because um, we started talking about all kinds of things. Now, some of it was retail, but we also talked about Rush because one of the things that, that Doug is involved in is a memorial to Neil Peart that's, that's underway, I guess. And um, uh, I said, and I will be helping, uh, the uh, Chris, who's in charge of that, making that happen. Um, I go way back with Rush. I, we don't have time to tell you the stories right now, but known the guys forever. And Neil Pert is considered one of the best drummers of all time, not just rock drummers, but period. And also, you know, a student of philosophy and, and just uh, uh, all the guys in Rush are, are pretty amazing people. So more on that, you know, if you you can't help but get emails from us. So you'll hear more about that. So um, what we're going to talk about now, or what Doug's going to talk about is, is 
some new ways, I guess, or, or different ways to look at retail. Okay, so first question is um, customer experience, which in my mind, when I go into most retail stores, customer experience is generally pretty bad, unfortunately. Um, but Doug, why is it such a hot topic today? How hasn't it always been important? Yeah, um, Jim, thanks, uh, thanks for having me, and and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, well, you know, I would say no. Customer experience hasn't been as important uh, historically as it is today, and I'll explain what I mean by that. I think if we're honest, and and for those of us on this uh, in this meeting today that are old enough to remember what retail was like 30 years ago. The truth of the matter is, as a merchant 30 years ago, really all you needed to do, not to take anything away from good merchants, but this is just simply the fact, what you really needed to do is identify a market that did not have access to a particular product or a particular brand. You needed to set up distribution in that market uh, you needed to provide a modicum of product information. And I say a modicum of product information because, of course, at the time, consumers lived in a vacuum, right? Uh, consumers really had no access to information unless it was being fed to them by a retailer or a brand. And, of, of course, you, you also needed to provide the product. You needed to provide access to the product and, and a means of transacting the product. Well, uh, that was then. Flash forward to today, and we have, uh, as consumers, we, our, our biggest problem today is not a lack of access to product, it's the abundance of choice that we have in terms of uh, the direct-to-consumer options that are coming to the market, massive marketplaces, Amazon sells 500 million different products, you know, um, and consumer information today is at our fingertips. It's entirely likely that the consumer coming into your store today may indeed know more about that Gibson ES335 than the person that's selling it to them or, or trying to sell it to them. So we, we live in a very, very different world. And really, when you get right down to it, the only differentiator between one retailer and another is the, the unique experience that they have designed and that they are executing and using to add value to that customer's experience. So, uh, no, I, I would say that uh, experience trumps everything today. It is absolutely paramount. So if, if a retailer is interested, um, and obviously better be, um, with creating a... a uh, better or differentiated customer experience, where should they start? And I guess we could target in on the entertainment or music field a bit, but you know, how do they, what, what do they do? They get up, you know, Monday and, and say, okay, here we go. Um, and I guess the other thing is what are the obstacles? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think one of the greatest obstacles, and this, this doesn't just apply to the music, category. It applies really to any business. I think that we, as business people, fall into the mindset that what we do is we, we transact products. You know, our, our job, our role, the purpose of our business is to distribute a product to a market. And, and I think that um, when we operate on that level psychologically, it really precludes any sort of significant experience. And I think it's the, the starting point. And when we work with brands through my company, this is where we start. We start with the big idea. So yeah, of course you sell musical instruments or you, you sell um, music, music lessons. Or, you know, that is what you trade in. That's how you kind of keep score, right? But the big idea, what, what is it that you're really selling? And, and I would argue that, especially in the music industry, you're selling entertainment, certainly. You're selling belonging. You're selling community. I don't think this will come as a shock to people on the call, but musicians as a, as a, as a, uh, a group of people very often 
feel at a young age that they don't fit in uh, to, to society as it's sort of, you know, cast for them. They feel sometimes like they're trying to find a place, trying to find a community where they can sense that belonging. And I think that the, the you know, when I was a kid growing up, and, and it's funny that somebody earlier mentioned Cosmo, I spent, if, well, I wouldn't even want to count the hours that I spent in Cosmo music as a kid, because for me, that was like a clubhouse, you know, that's where I had a sense of belonging. And, and that's where I could while away the hours and, and really um, enjoy myself. So we're selling something really powerful. We're selling community. We're selling belonging. We're selling inspiration. And certainly we're selling entertainment. So that's the starting point. The next step, I think, Jim, is that we have to understand that um, everything about that experience needs to be deliberate and by design. And I think, again, if we're honest, most businesses just sort of swing the doors open in the morning with a vague idea of the experience that they would like consumers to walk away with. And for the most part, things are kind of left to chance. But when we think about great businesses, you know, like a Ritz Carlton hotel experience or an Apple store experience, nothing is left to chance. So the way we put it to our clients is think of it as a theatrical production. And, and the people, you know, here today will, will relate to this. If you were putting on a concert or you were putting on a theatrical production, would you just sort of cast anyone in the roles that you were, you know, that that you were part of the show? Would you just leave the lines that they were speaking to the audience up to them? Just improvise, say whatever you feel like. Uh, would you leave the set design to to chance, or would you make sure that every single element of that set design made sense? And then, of course, every scene within the production has to be again thought through. Uh, you need to know your motivation. So. If you treat your store like a theatrical production, and it's not just opening the doors in the morning and seeing what's happening, you know, what happens that day, it's raising the curtain on a production that your customer is walking into and immediately becoming part of, becoming galvanized into that experience. It's a, it's a really great way to think about what you do. And breaking down every single moment you know, to really design it with, uh, with intent. And, and, and finally, the litmus test, I think, is if you step back with a fresh pair of eyes and you look at your store environment, um, what we say to our clients is this, use what we call the super test. And super is an acronym that stands for surprising, unique, personalized, engaging, and repeatable. That's what you want that experience to be. So step back with a fresh pair of eyes and ask yourself, is my store, is there anything about my store that is truly surprising that would be, you know, unlike anything that someone might have experienced before? Is it unique? Is it different from my competitors, different from the store down the street from me? Is it personalized? Am I getting to know customers? Am I creating ways for customers to engage with us on a more personal level? And then finally, is it engaging? Am I giving people opportunities to touch things, try things, hear things, uh, you know, be a part of that environment? And then have we practiced this ritual of customer experience to the point where we can uh, execute that customer experience over and over again with a high degree of excellence? Excellent. Um, Doug has written uh, three books on these these subjects, um, and just writing one book is a challenge. I can't even imagine how you've got all that done. Um, we, we we will we are now carrying all three of his books, music books plus. So in your resources email, you'll you'll hear about that. So one of the things that you talk about is the the store, uh, which is almost an outdated term. The store is actually a medium itself. So it's a marketing medium. So you've got, you know, there's all kinds of mediums, but but most retailers don't think of it that way. So maybe you can explain how that works. It's not just using the internet or the newspaper or countless other media. Your yeah. store itself is actually a medium. Indeed. And, and I argue that your store is actually the most powerful, manageable, 
and measurable form of media that you as a merchant have at your disposal. And I'll explain what I mean. Traditionally, when we think about retail, we think about an exercise in going out on the open market, buying media in an effort to drive people to a point of distribution, whether that's a website or a store. But today, what we know uh, by research is that in the consumer's mind, this is the store. In 70 to 80% of cases, when it occurs to someone that they need something, in 70 to 80% of cases, they are going directly to Amazon to search for that product first. And that's just a fact. And today, uh, buying opportunities for products are woven into virtually every experience that we have, every YouTube video that I watch, every Instagram post. So in a growing way, media in the consumer's mind is becoming the store. And, and it's becoming a very efficient place to merchandise products, to provide accurate product information, and of course, to transact sales. So it begs the question, okay, well, if media is becoming the store, then what is the purpose of having a brick and mortar store? And this is where it gets, in my opinion, thrilling, because stores are becoming a really powerful channel for media. And I'll explain quickly what I mean. If we go back a thousand years and we ask ourselves, what was the prevalent form of media a thousand years ago? It was the market. It was the, the central square of the city where people went and they, they, uh, you know, they engaged in commerce, they talked politics, they found you know, like what, what are the fashionable togas uh, to be wearing, that sort of thing. The market, was the prevalent form of media. And then over time, that was displaced somewhat by the printed word and then radio and television. And today it's digital. Digital is the campfire that we gather around today, but there's a problem. And the problem is this, the cost of digital media today, the cost of acquiring customers through digital media is prohibitive. I mean, we have seen just from 2016 to 2021, a tenfold increase in the cost of customer acquisition through digital channels. So for many brands, we're priced out of that market. And moreover, and perhaps even worse, we know too that about 70 cents on every dollar spent on digital media evaporates. Consumer never sees your ad. They never engage with, uh, with what you're communicating. And a lot of it get, gets eaten up uh, with fees and, and other costs. So as a form of customer acquisition, digital media is very quickly becoming untenable. However, let's contrast that against your store where you can physically validate that a consumer's come in, you can engage with that customer in a meaningful way, in a real human way for an extended period of time, and you can really measure the response to that media experience within your store. So we need to sort of shift the lens. We need to start looking at media as an opportunity to sell things. And we need to start looking at our stores as a sort of the wide end of the funnel for customer acquisition, to bring people into your brand ecosystem. And once they're in there, and once you've really treated them to that super experience that I talked about earlier, you have that customer for life. I promise you that. And speaking of customers for life, I am spending a lot of time again in music stores because after 20 years of sort of looking at my guitar in the corner, I've decided to take it back up and learn how to be a better guitarist. So I may be, I may be haunting some of your doorsteps. Excellent. Great uh, information. And I think a lot of the people here have some things to think about. Um, and, and it is exciting because it, it means that uh, bricks and mortar aren't going anywhere. That's still around. It just has to be reconceived and, and everything has to be reconceived, basically. So.